Hello everybody, and welcome to my premiere video on my YouTube channel. I've been thinking about doing this for a while, since there's a lot of things that I've been learning about Go that don't really lend themselves to being part of a course on Pluralsight.com. So I thought, well, I want to talk about this stuff, and Pluralsight doesn't really seem like the right place to do it, so I uh, put some feelers out there, and some of you seem to think that a YouTube channel could be a valuable contribution, so I thought that I'd try that out. So, one thing you're going to notice is the format of the videos on this, at least the way I'm planning on, it's going to be quite a bit different than what you see on my Pluralsight videos. Those videos typically take about 20 hours of work for every hour of content that you see. What I'm planning on doing here is doing a little bit of preparation and then a much more free form kind of live recording format. So hopefully it works. Let me know in the comments if you see something that works well or doesn't wor really work well. Also, if you think that there's something uh, that you'd like me to talk about, feel free to put that in the comments uh, as well, or go ahead and tweet to me, and uh, we'll see if we can get it lined up for y'all. Okay, so without further ado, what are we going to be talking about today? So what I was thinking about is that there's a lot of people who are new to the Go community that have an expectation for how autocomplete should work. So a lot of them go over to, a lot of them after some research, discover this wonderful library over here on GitHub maintained by NSF. This package is intended to provide a daemon that will provide autocomplete functionality to various editors such as Atom, the one that I use, as well as uh, Vim and Emacs and several others. So. The issue that you run into is that it doesn't exactly detect autocomplete information the way that we expect it to. So let me jump over into Atom and generate some code and we'll see if I can show you what I'm talking about. So over here I'm going to create a new package inside of my project folder and I'm going to call it my pack because that's a great name for a package. And inside of that I'll create a new source file called source.go. Of course, I've got to add the package declaration here. And then I'm going to just expose a couple of public variables here. Maybe a variable called foo, and then we'll do a function called bar, and it'll print bar out to the console. Something simple. It doesn't have to be very complicated. And we'll go ahead and save that. Now, if I go over and create a main entry point called main.go, give it the package main, and give it the main function as the entry point, then I should be able to import my pack and see my pack dot and there's nothing there. Now the reason for this is that Go code expects the libraries to all be installed before it's able to use them. So I can do something like this my pack dot foo and I can then call I can also call bar so then I should be able to open up a terminal and use go run in order to run this. And we see that it finds those package level entities. So what's going on here? Well, it turns out that again, like I mentioned earlier, Go code expects those packages to be installed and pre-compiled, and it reads the pre-compiled binaries in order to find the autocomplete information. So if I do something like this, go install my pack, it found that, and then I can come back here and see that there's a package that's got mypack.a, which is a pre-compiled binary that's ready to be compiled into a larger application. So now if I come back here and hit dot, now I've got my autocomplete information. So this is great, except for when you're doing live coding, you don't want to be constantly jumping out to a console and recompiling your library files all the time. So what I've done is I've used Gulp, which is a Node.js module, in order to create a watcher script that's going to precompile those libraries for me, and I'd like to show you how to do that. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, if you haven't used Node before, first of all, I'm really surprised if you haven't used Node before, but you can install Node over here on nodejs.org. So you'll know that you've got Node installed, uh, you can type Node and it'll give you a command prompt or you can type node help and you'll get node coming up here so if we have that then we also have npm which is the node package manager the node package manager is used to install libraries for a node development environment 
Okay, that finally ran. So we have N we have Node, we have npm. If you if you don't have it on your system, then you can follow the download instructions that are going to be platform specific. It's for you. The instructions are pretty simple to get set up. After that, we're going to need to install a package. We're going to need to install a task runner, and the one I've picked is at gulpjs.com. Now there are two that you're really going to find out in the wild. One is Gulp, and the other is Grunt. Grunt's a little bit older and has a very active ecosystem. Gulp is as well. And it's really six of one, half dozen of the other, um, of which one you decide to use. I'm using Gulp for this one, more or less, because I wanted to explore how to use Gulp. I hadn't used it very much, so that was my reasoning. So we're not going to use need any additional plugins for um, for this to work. So we're just going to go ahead and get in here and get started. Okay, so let me close this down here, and let's get this installed. The way I'm going to start this is I need to pull up a command prompt. And I'm going to make sure that I'm going to set up a node project by using the npm init command. What that's going to do is that's going to create a file called package.json. And it's going to ask you a couple of questions. I'm just going to go through these very quickly in order to get the file generated here. And what this is going, to, it's going to let me do is it's going to let me save dependencies uh, for installation later on. That way I don't have to distribute the node modules to all of the other people that are working on this project with me, and I also don't have to check them in, into source control. So in, in order to install Gulp locally, I'm going to use npm install, and I'm going to type save dev gulp. It's going to crunch away for a little bit, downloading the repository, and install that as a local dependency. Now if you haven't used gulp before, and if maybe you haven't used npm before, we're also going to have to install that globally. Now what happens is the global instance will point to the local instance if it can find one, but that's also going to let us use gulp on the command line um, without having to screw around with the path too much. So in order to install gulp globally, I'm going to provide a dash g flag and gulp as well. again. Give that a few minutes to finish up, and there we go. Now, if you're, we can verify that gulp is working by doing gulp version, but if you're a Windows user like I am, then that's not going to work for you right out of the box. The reason is because we have to add onto the path, we just drill down through here, we have to go into the app data roaming npm, and this folder is where the actual command is living that's going to run gulp for us. So if you don't have that on the, your path, you're going to have to add, your path is going to look something like this on Windows 10. You're going to have to add that to your path in order for Gulp to get working. Now that we have that, though, we should be able to Gulp init. Oh, that's not going to work. Okay, I guess there, we have to create the Gulp file first. So I'm going to close this off. And Gulp configuration is handled inside of a file called gulpfile.js. Now this is a normal JavaScript file, and it can do a lot of the things that JavaScript can do but it uses the Node Package Manager format. So if you're used to uh, client-side development with JavaScript, it's going to look a little bit different than what you're used to. So we're going to start by importing a couple of dependencies. First of all, of course, we're going to need Gulp itself in order to get access to its API. Then we're also going to need the path package because we're going to be doing some, path, some manipulation of the file paths that are, uh, are getting edited. And we're also going to use the shell package which is going to let us execute a command a shell on the command line. Actually, hold on a second. I think that I need to npm install save save dev the gulp shell because I think that that's an external dependency. Okay, so we'll give that a couple of seconds to find it and download it and install it. Okay, so if I come up to the package JSON file, we see in the dev dependency section, you should see gulp and gulp shell listed here. The rest of it is the answer to the questions uh, that it asked you when it was initializing the package.json file with the npm init command. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do is I want to set up a local variable because we're going to use this a couple times that's going to point to the location of our library files. 
So this can be an array of all the files that you need, but you need to make sure that each one of your packages is, is installed. This lit works really well if all of your project code is, work, is living underneath one main package like we're doing here. Okay, the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to create what's called a gulp task. Gulp is a task manager and therefore its job is to create tasks. So I'm going to create a compile package task. And what that task takes is it takes a function that's going to actually describe what the task is. Inside of that, I'm going to return a call to the gulp dot source command passing, passing in the path that I wanted to watch and then a configuration object what it's going to do is it's going to read all those files but it's not going to read the contents it's just going to read the file paths themselves that's what that read false is doing and then I'm going to pass that into the pipe command the pipe function and that's going to use this shell module here in order to execute a shell command. So that shell command goes inside of a, an array because you can run an, an array of shell commands. And we're going to run go install just like we would do from the command line. But we need to find a way to dynamically determine what file path in order to pass. So we're going to do that by using this uh, syntax here. Which let me just get this typed in then we'll, uh, I'll go over what this means. So this is almost like if you used any other templating engine. This is a template that it's going to inject. So it's going to find a strip path function that we'll create in a second. I'm going to pass the file.path. That's something that the shell command knows about because it got the file from the pipe. And it's going to then run whatever the strip path is and inject the result of that function call right here. Right here. So our goal is that this should eventually be go install my package. Got it? Okay, let's see how we're going to do that. So the shell command takes a second argument, and that argument is going to be the context that the shell command is going to run in. So let me clean this up just a little bit. Okay, now I'm happy. And I'm going to pass in a template data object into this context, and that's going to contain the strip path function. So just to review, when I when this gets called, when it hits this command, it's going to pass this file.path into the strip path function. That strip path function is defined down here. Okay, the next thing we need to do is we just need to screw around with the path a little bit. I've built this on Windows, so I imagine that it's going to be very similar to do this on um, a Mac or Linux as well, but I can't guarantee that, so please don't hold me to anything. Okay, so what this first command did was it looks at the current working directory of the process. This is where Gulp is running. It's going to find the length of that path, plus 5. Um, and it's going to deter, so that's going to be the root path, plus 5. And what that's going to do is it's going to lop off this slash source directory that we have here. Um, next thing I need to do is actually get the package, which will be subpath.substring of 0, comma, subpath dot last index of path dot separator so that should be a little that should be platform neutral and then return package so you have to go through this I don't want to go through the exact what this syntax is doing but basically what I need to do is I need to lop off the file name let me correct my spelling issue here I need to lop off the file name uh, so if I'm dealing in source.go, I don't want that to be included in the go install command. And I need to lop off the front of the path. So the subpath here, that's lopping off all the C colon backslash blah 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 stuff. And this command here, that's lopping off the source.go. So what it's going to do is it's going to watch for a file to change. When that file changes, it's going to pair that down to the package that that file is contained within. And it's going to reinstall that. The last thing I need to do assuming I've done everything right so far, is use gulp task. And I'm going to use a special task called watch. Now a watch task is uses the built-in, or we're going to use the built-in gulp watch function to watch the go path. That's the one we declared up here. And we are going to tell it to run the compile package task every time one of those files changes. And that should be it. So let's save it 
and I hope I got all this right. Uh, if I did, then I should be able to jump out to a terminal and do a gulp watch. Moment of truth. Okay, now gulp watch. So the gulp is the gulp command. Watch is the name of this task. So we're running the watch task with gulp. And it says it's, that and it says that it's fired up and is now watching for files to change. So if I leave that over here and snap this over here. Okay. Let's see what happens if I change one of my files. So maybe we want to add another funk called baz, and it's going to do the creative stuff of just print baz to the command line. If I save that, everything blew up. Okay, uh, process is not defined. Okay, it looks like I've got a bit of a typo here. Where's that at? That's on line 13. Ah, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, let's try this again. Go watch. Okay, so now we should we shouldn't take any significant change here, so we should just be able to change this, recompile, and there we go. So if I did my job right here, we should be able to do my pack dot, and there we go. Now we've got Baz. So I hope that this helps you out. Um, what you need to do in every uh, project that you're going to do then is you use basically this gulp file again. The only thing I change is to make sure that that go path is correct. So if I've got like the course I just finished on distributed applications with Go, I, instead of my pack I had distributed here because I grouped all of my source code under that. If you're doing a uh, if you're working on an open source project, then you'd probably do something like this, and it's going to look for all those files. Uh, the only reason you can't just do this if you were thinking about it, is that's going to pick up the main.go and the pa it's going to look for a main package because it's going to find this inside a source. It's not going to find a proper package and that's not going to work for you. So if you don't have a main.go file, then you can do this as long as you don't have a file right here in the source directory. If everything's inside of a package, then this path should work for you as well. For me, I need to do something like this because I typically have an entry point right there in the, uh, in the source directory. Okay, so if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to uh, list them down below. Any suggestions or for improvements, let me know. Um, uh, again, I'm learning here, and I uh, look forward to hearing your feedback, okay? So until next time, this is Michael Vansicle. Take care.